couple of weeks ago, the internet went down. So we had to do the show without mm. that, but <laughs> this paper still worked. Yeah. Every time. As soon as it goes to zero, you can do your boilerplate. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody who's already tuned in live. As we've been telling you all week long, we're going to take a deep dive into the all-new Volkswagen Jetta. We've got Daniel Shapiro from Volkswagen here to help us do just that. And if you'd like to ask questions about the Jetta, what Volkswagen's doing in the U.S. market and the like, shoot us an email. Send it to viewer mail at autoline.tv. And, of course, we take phone calls as well. And that number is 620-288-6546. And uh, we're going to get going here in just a moment. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. All right, everybody, welcome to Auto Line After Hours, especially you, Mr. Gary Vasilash. How are you, John? I'm doing pretty good. Good. So I was just um, out at the uh, FCA What's New program. and uh, That's where Fiat Chrysler shows everything. everything new that they're doing for the next year. And uh, so I had an opportunity to do something that I'm sure you'd have enjoyed. Our, our friend Mark Allen, who's the uh, head of design at Jeep that we had on the show, we did from L.A. about the Wrangler. Yeah. So they had an off-road course, and so Mark and I went out and took a couple of spins on the off-road course. And uh, it's a lot of fun with a guy who spends time designing Jeeps and... Uh, who is the key guy, and uh, you know, with Jeep being so important out of that brand, it's uh, it's quite a quite a. Interesting that's that's the one phenomenon. good thing about our job, isn't it? I mean, to say you're going to work to drive around with Jeeps at the proving grounds with mm -hmm. Mark Allen, nice way to go to to work every day. It is. Well, maybe not every day, but no, it was, it was great, and, and uh, yeah, he was he was asking about you, so uh, so he remembers me. Of uh, course. <laughs> Hey, we should let everybody know that Mike Austin from Haggerty is also joining us. On, well, hey, wait a minute. His chair is empty. He's invisible, Mike's not he's here. invisible for now. No, he warned me. He's going to be coming late. Uh, he's tied up in traffic, but we'll welcome him on board when he gets here. But what we've got to let everybody know is our special guest for today is Daniel Shapiro with Volkswagen, product manager for the Volkswagen Jetta. And great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. And it's, uh, we also have a Jetta in the studio here with us, and we always like having a car in the studio as well. So we thank you for that as well. It's my pleasure as well. You know, the thing that really surprised me about the Jetta was, was the fact that this is the most successful European nameplate in the United States, the that Jetta. Is, that is correct. See, I, I, I would have thought it would have been the Beetle. Or the Golf. Or the golf. Well, to put some numbers behind it, um, since the car was introduced in 1979 as a model year 80, we have sold over 3 million of them here in the U.S. So it's uh, quite a popular car. It's been our one of our high volume cars, our bread and butter, for years and years. Actually, worldwide, it's also extremely popular. It's sold over 17 million cars worldwide since wow. its inception. Why is the Jetta more popular than the Golf in the U.S. market? Interesting question. Uh, it didn't always. Because it's it didn't always in the use, rest of the world, right? Yeah. Golf is number one in the rest of the world. It depends it? where you go. Oh, really? Believe it or not, in some years, actually, Jetta production or Jetta sales have outsold Golf, um, depending on which years you look at. But the U.S. market has always been a sedan market, primarily, not so much a hatchback. The Golf used to sell much better here, back in the '80s, or it used to be roughly half and half Jetta and Golf. Um, but primarily, the sedan has held true and true, really, to just what, what people are looking for here. And uh, it's a slightly larger car. People have a sense of uh, better security in it by having a, a larger rear end to absorb rear impacts as well. Um, can store more in the car as well in a, in a formal trunk. So tell us where the Jetta sits in the market. I mean, mm -hmm. what marks do you compare? compete with with this vehicle. Mm. So the Jetta is officially a compact car and uh, it will competing will compete against uh, your other vehicles such as Honda Civic, Toyota Corolla, Kia Forte, Chevrolet Cruze, uh, Hyundai Elantra. 
Mazda 3. Uh, it is uh, a larger segment than your subcompact segment, which would be like your Hyundai Accents, your Ford Fiestas, um, cars such as that. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, I would say, no longer your entry-level car, because now we have these subcompacts or sub-subcompacts that have been on the market for a few years. So it's somebody who's not quite getting a full-size family car, um, but they don't want a teeny-weeny tiny car. So, so where does well, it... whoa, whoa, hold on. Mike Austin is in the studio now with us. <laughs> So we've got to introduce I it was here him. all along. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. We started the show without you anyway. That, that's fine. Uh, we figured you'd get here. Yeah. So here we are talking all about the Volkswagen Jetta with Daniel Shapiro. Yeah. Um, well, and I'll chime in uh, with your, your comment about a family car because I looked this up. The current new Jetta 2019 is within a couple inches of the like 06, 07 Passat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I, when I drove it, I got in. I was like, "This is pretty big. This is a sizable car." It's, it, it's not the what maybe when you think of Jetta, you think of like more entry level compact size, and it's not. It's bigger. No, it's actually the longest compact car there in the segment as it exists right now. Um, but even our direct competitors have grown bigger and bigger over right. time. I mean, even a Civic today is probably the size of a 1990 Accord mm -hmm. if you really put them side by side. It's pretty amazing how everything just stretches over time. So, so in the Volkswagen car lineup, mm -hmm. so it's Passat, Jetta, Golf, Beetle? Actually, uh, the Jetta is the entry to our brand here in the U.S. It is the least expensive car that Volkswagen offers really? here in the USA, hmm. believe it or not. So that, the Jetta, as we have here in the studio, that is, uh, that is our entry car. Uh, as opposed to other markets in the world that may have a, like a Volkswagen Polo or a Volkswagen Up, which is all over Europe. But... We, we don't offer those here. Um, you can see them in Mexico, but no, not here in the States. It surprises me because I look at that and I, I see a bigger car and I think of a Golf as maybe being the entry. Is that just... So the, the Golf is actually slightly more expensive than a Jetta. And same as uh, with the Beetle as well. At least in terms of price, not size. Uh, the Jetta is really the entry. Daniel, when you set out uh, to, to develop this car for mm -hmm. the U.S. market, where were some of the the boxes you felt you absolutely had to check mm. that maybe you wouldn't have paid as much attention to in markets outside of the U.S.? So what, it's actually a, a very interesting question. I'll, I'll answer it a little bit a roundabout way. So with the development of, of this latest generation of the Jetta, we really had a very unique relationship with Germany that I don't think has ever existed. Um, so this car was very, very much focused on the North American market, meaning Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And as such, the U.S. being the, the greatest part of that, that market in the region, we really worked hand in hand with Germany and even with the engineering teams in, in Mexico to develop the car uh, and to really f tailor it to this market. So it's not being um, side development for Africa or for Russia or for the South Americas. We really had a, we're with our colleagues hand in hand through the entire process from the early, early concepts all the way to the launch of the car just a few months ago. So, for example, the, the engine, the powertrain on the car, uh, there's only a few powertrains developed for the Jetta, uh, but primarily is the, the 1.4 turbo engine, which is in there. It's the only engine for the U.S. market, um, and that's on purpose. And we needed to have the horsepower and the torque that American buyers expect to give you that, that pull onto the highway uh, with that zero to 60 time that you feel you need and expect to be safe so that you don't have a, an uncomfortable merge experience, but also the, the driving dynamics that everybody has actually caught up or come close to catching up with Volkswagen. And that's one of our, our core competencies. And so we've stepped it up a notch mm -hmm. using uh, the new MKB chassis, which is being launched worldwide on, on all of our platforms. Yeah. So, so MQB in, mm -hmm. in Volkswagen talks about these things a lot. Mm -hmm. So simply explain to us what that means. So I will not explain it in the German terminology because I will tongue tie myself. But to make it very simple, MQB, it's a, a platform structure, both a, a structure to the vehicle chassis and its unibody itself, which has been uh, created mostly uniform. Um, so the... Uh, the front end of the car from the, the front axle all the way to the front bumper. Essentially, it follows a standard structure to the car. And then from the, the rear axle to the rear of the car, uh, mostly the same. But we can stretch that wheelbase 
as necessary, whether it's a compact car, a family car, or even a, a large limousine sized car. But that same methodology also falls into our SUVs as well. So by doing that, there's a lot of common parts that we can take off of, off of the shelf and have a common toolbox, but also a lot of those structures for the car are, uh, are commonized. So they aren't redesigned all over again when you switch to a new vehicle. They can still use a lot of those lessons learned or they can adapt those parts to the new one. And similarly on the electrical architecture, um, a lot of those things, yes, you'll have a unique wiring harness for the car, but everything from light switches to radios to uh, gear shifters, uh, a lot of that can be commonized and you get tremendous economies of scale um, by using both the, the mechanical structural pieces as well as the electrical architecture. So MQB is more than just the underbody? Yeah. It's also an, an, a complete electrical architecture. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you mentioned there's one engine, but mm -hmm. I also noticed that Volkswagen is going out to Bonneville Speed Week and going for a land speed record, and that car has a two liter. Yes, it so, does. Is that a hint that maybe we'll see a two liter in the Jetta, like Return of the GLI? It's not a hint. We've, we've already stated GLI is coming back. Uh, it is on hiatus for a brief period of time, but there will be a GLI coming very soon. Uh, we are dedicated to that performance part of the market, and GLI has a very strong heritage. They're for uh, over 30 years. We've had GLIs in the market. Uh, it's a great car. GTI for Golf has been a, a wonderful seller for us, and it has a, a tremendous fan following, and the GLIs are, are no exception as well. So we are excited that there will be a GLI version of this car coming. And you, and you offer a manual transmission. Sometimes we see Mike wearing these buttons mm -hmm. that say, save the manual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got it on the logo. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's got, uh, yeah. So is that available? Is it just in the entry model or across the line? For the time being, it is only offered in the entry car, uh, the Jetta S, uh, which comes with either an eight-speed automatic or a six-speed manual. We have at least stepped up the game. So instead of just a standard 5C manual, it is a six-speed manual. So that's good. Uh, and we are investigating options to actually expand that further. But um, there's two sides of the fence. On the one hand, we do have the diehards, the, the people that love driving their car and being one on one with it and shifting with a clutch. And then but, there's uh, everybody else. <laughs> but quite honestly, you, it's a, a dying part of the population, not literally, but yeah. More and more people are switching to automatics, especially as automatic performance has is, is improved dramatically over the years, and automatics actually get better fuel economy than well, the, That was one thing I, I also noticed, that it has shifted that almost always, it used to be the manual was the more fuel efficient mm -hmm. choice. That's shifted. In the Jetta, they have the same rating. Correct, yes. Uh, so at least something for the manual. Crowd. Something, <laughs> yes. But even in uh, the GTI and the GLI, where we've, uh, we've, at least the past few years, we've had the DSG, um, the dual clutch, Auto, um, automatic, and that's actually gotten better fuel economy than the manual version of the cars as well. You know, it's, it's really astonishing. I mean, you just sort of went by quickly, but I mean, mm -hmm. so here is this entry-level car with an eight-speed automatic transmission. Mm -hmm. I mean, th that's <laughs> that's crazy. I mean, if we were, we were, you know, five years ago, you would have been saying, you know, an Audi maybe has an mm -hmm. eight-speed. Now you guys have it in this car. Uh, very clever engineering. <laughs> Not to be too facetious about it, but it's also um, that eight-speed automatic. It's actually a first for the entire Volkswagen group. So it's a brand new transmission worldwide. It is launching on the Jetta. Um, we're very happy to have it. It helps tremendously with fuel economy. It's, it actually shifts very, very smoothly. Um, when you get in the car, it just takes off. It gets you up to speed without even realizing it. Um, and also, um, it. In a way, there is really no option for us in terms of do you stay with a, a six-speed automatic as we had done, and do you get the performance and the efficiency benefits that we would expect to get? And you're, you're reaching the limits of what's possible. Um, we, looking at CVTs, which a lot of manufacturers have done, that's almost the antithesis of what Volkswagen stands for. I mean, in very much a driver's car, I mean, we always have been very much about driving, and that's in our DNA. CVTs are not the most enthusiastic thing to put your foot to the metal with against the floor. Mm -hmm. And so we needed a, a real automatic for this car because the Jetta, it, it's a Volkswagen. It's going to have the same DNA just like any other Volkswagen. We won't compromise on it. 
We're getting a number of questions in here about the car. Joe Laszlo wants to know, is there a European version of the Jetta? That's an excellent question. There actually, even in the previous generation car, I think, I, I may be mistaken, but I believe Model Year 16 was the last of the European Jettas. So a few years back, they actually took it off of the German market. But this car, as I said, it was dedicated and focused on the North American market. There is no European version whatsoever. Hmm. Maybe a, a few sales to South America, to uh, a few c countries down there, and to uh, a few um, side countries elsewhere in the world, but no European version whatsoever. It is a North American car. Vic Maslanka wants to know, when does the 220 horsepower GTI engine move into other products like the Jetta? He also mentions the Passat and Tiguan. Hmm. I can only say stay tuned. Uh, you will not be disappointed. All right. Good so, question. Vic. Unfortunately, I cannot disclose information about future products, but GLI is definitely coming and you will not be disappointed. You may be pleasantly surprised. Okay, sort of along the performance lines, Wright Knight wrote in, Wright Knight 70 wrote in to ask, will there be an all-wheel drive high-performance version of the Jetta? Mm. He also goes on to say, if so, would it be named after a German jet fighter? And he says that would be <laughs> awesome. It would be awesome. <laughs> and uh, outside of the jet fighter, uh, the thought did cross our mind. Because uh, when you start to think of what if uh, there was a Jetta R version, like there's a Golf R. But unfortunately, no, this car will not have all-wheel drive as an option. That's not saying we might not pursue it in the future, but at least at this time, there are no plans for an all-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're talking about platforms and a component perspective, um, and you know, with the Golf and specifically the Golf Sport Wagon, it, at different points in the history, there was you know, different levels of commonality between the Golf and the Jetta. Mm -hmm. Um, how is this in terms of, you know, uh, the front end? You know, could you interchange mm -hmm. the front end or the dimensions different or the structure different? How much is shared with the Golf or different versions of the Golf? If you were, there's a limit to what you could interchange on the Golf, today's Golf. Mm -hmm. So in the past, say with the fourth generation Jet and the fourth generation Golf, they shared a lot of front end and rear end parts. Um, different grills, but they had uh, same front doors. Um, a lot of the same interior parts. There is a, a much greater disparity with this seventh generation Jetta against the seventh generation Golf. They're almost two separate cars in a way. Yes, they do share the MQB chassis, but in terms of body panels, in terms of bumpers, um, other things like that, they are unfortunately very, very different from one another. Um, we do strive to commonize them as much as possible, and there are efforts toward doing that in the future. Um, but even the light, the headlight switch in this car, it's actually a, a next generation for the entire family of, of Volkswagen vehicles. So that, that will not work in a Golf. Golf actually will be copying Jetta in, in the near future right. in that case. Okay, we've got some alternative powertrain questions here. Sub GR77 wants to know if you're going to have a battery electric version. Mm. Levante wants to know if there's going to be a Jetta hybrid. Unfortunately, no and no. Um, quite honestly, uh, when we ask people what do they want in their powertrain and yet in California especially there is a lot of demand for hybrids but more importantly people are asking because they want the fuel economy not necessarily because they want a hybrid uh, with this latest generation car and the 1.4 turbo engine that's been further tweaked from the previous version of it we get an EPA estimated fuel economy of 40 highway but I can say at least from my own experience that is extremely conservative so even this morning, driving on the way into the airport, I got 49 miles per gallon with, with the automatic. Yow. So, so you, you raise a really good point. You're saying people really want fuel economy, not necessarily just have a hybrid. I mean, some people do want a hybrid because it, it uh, does have fewer emissions, and there's a benefit to that. But I think the main driver for mo most people is they want the fuel economy. Okay. Um, and with this latest version of the Jetta, the fuel economy, even by EPA standards, is in, in the 40s. Hmm. And... Uh, I don't think people will be disappointed with that at all. Uh, they really want a car that comes down to a very low cost of ownership and that will grow with them over time. But it, they re really think uh, out of their wallet. Well, one than. of the things people also want is stuff, electronic stuff yes. in their car. So what do you guys bring? Where do you want me to begin? <laughs> <laughs> so I can say there have been a lot of strategic decisions on this car and especially with MQB, we were able to get them into the affordable range. So every single Jetta, even your entry car, has standard LED headlights, LED daytime running lights, LED taillights. 
Nobody else in the segment can claim having all of those at once. So that's a Jetta first for the segment. Inside the car, uh, we have great radios. Those are MIB radios. Uh, it's a whole family, uh, starting with what we call the composition color, the composition media, and the discover media. Um, but in, in many ways, they are best in class. Um, they're actually uh, HD level screens, similar to what your iPhone or your, your Android phone would have, extremely um, these retina sort of displays. Very high resolution, very fast, very, very capable systems. Um, but outside of infotainment and our maps, we also have a telematic system, which we call Carnet. That is in our, our SEL and SEL premiums. Also in the SEL and SEL premiums, we have even more techie goodies. So that's where the market is going. People like stuff. Um, so we have a brand new version of our digital cockpit, which first launched in the Atlas and Tiguan last year. We're thinking it's only 2017 when those came out. We have a new version of the digital cockpit in the Jetta, which is completely configurable. Um, so it's not just changing views. You can change the information on the fly between the left and the right side of the display. If you have navigation in the car, it will uh, move the entire display out, and you will have a full navigation view in your in your instrument cluster, similar to what Audi does in theirs. Mm -hmm. And that's in the compact class yeah. in, in your volume that's segment. That's pretty impressive. Nobody else can right. do that. OK, uh, Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, you got Stan that too? Standard in the car, not optional. Great. Um, so right off the bat, um, some cars also have what we call a ambient lighting. It goes beyond what our competitors offer. So we, we have lights which go in the, through the door card, across the dash, and through the other door card. So really within the entire peripheral vision of the driver. But what we can do that nobody else can do, it's also integrated with the instrument cluster, this digital cockpit, and the infotainment display. And it also is customizable to 10 colors. So everything from your whites and your blues to your yellows and your hot pinks. And it really at night when it really you can see it, it completely changes the interior mood of the car, quite honestly. It, Completely it, agree. It's, I, it's, I've it's seen changes. it in other cars, too. So, so, so the I, driver I makes a selection of what color they want to have you, you, accentuation as, exactly. as they you drive. You can either put it on manual choice, where you can select, I just want hot pink, and it's, everything is hot pink. Everything is hot pink. <laughs> um, or you can set it on automatic, and then it's actually tied to the personalization feature that we have in the car that ties the accelerator sensitivity, the steering sensitivity, um, and some other aspects of the car, and it ties that, and it, say you go into sport mode, it not only changes these, these settings, but it also changes the entire mood of the car to red, to mm -hmm. resemble sport mode, for example. Okay, Albert Maniscalco wrote in to ask, why have the last generations been so conservatively styled? Mm. I'd Conservative is one way to put it. We like to think of it as timeless, and actually, if you look at the, the 2010 Jetta, which was the, the first year of the last generation, those cars still actually look good on the road. They don't, they don't age that much, um, as opposed to some of our other competitors out there. Um, but when they did come out, that actually was pretty dramatic styling for its time. And um, Volkswagen likes to think of itself more as timeless. They, it's a large company. Things tend to be a little conservative. They make evolutionary steps as opposed to revolu revolutionary steps, excuse me. Um, and we have actually pushed the limit by working with them on this car. So a lot of the really key um, bends you see in the sheet metal or some of the wheel designs or even um, the lowered rear roof, a lot of that was due to our involvement and in really pushing Germany for what is necessary in, in the US and, and the North American market. VW's got a good television ad running in the U.S. market mm -hmm. right now. I, I, I believe it's the old generation Jetta, mm -hmm. and it sort of shakes itself like a wet dog, yeah. and it shakes off old parts of the design, and you see the new one. Correct. And if you look at the old car and you look at the new one, you go, oh, that's not that different. But when you see that, that shaking and the new styling appear, then you go, oh, yeah, no, that is quite a bit different. It's, it's completely different, even from the, the previous generation car from last year's car. When you look at them side by side, they're completely, absolutely completely different cars. And not just from an, an exterior styling point of view, but even the innards of the car, the only thing that is carryover on this car is the engine, the 1.4 liter engine. And even that has been retuned and retweaked for this generation. So the wheel bearings, the uh, brake booster, 
the steering wheel, everything is completely soup to nuts brand new on this car. Abby from Texas writes in to say, hey, I was looking at the new Jetta, noticed there's no rear vents. He says, I think not having no rear vents, no matter what car, makes it look cheap. Uh, you have rear vents in the Golf, which is smaller. So what happened? Actually, no, when you look at all of our sedan competitors, nobody has rear vents. Really? Nobody. Hmm. It, it, the, the discussion did come up, believe me. But it, it's, uh, yes, it would set us up, um, apart from the competition. But at the same time, when we look to see who's using the car, who is the customer, Primarily, you have one person driving the car. It's a commuter car by a lot of people. Maybe you have a young couple driving the car. It's very rare that there's actually somebody in the rear seat. Maybe you take some friends out uh, for a night on the town or to dinner. Um, maybe it's a very young family, but very shortly thereafter, that family upgrades to uh, a Volkswagen Passat or another family car. So um, for that rear seat comfort, Absolutely agree. Vents, rear vents would be really nice, but at the same time, the compact car segment, it's extremely price sensitive, and we don't want to put anything into the car that's superfluous. That really, why put something in there that people don't really want or that they wouldn't really use? We'd rather spend the money on the stuff that they're really asking for. Mm -hmm. so, 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 to, so go back to the styling and mm -hmm. the customer. So, so you mentioned competitors include the Mazda 3, mm -hmm. the Civic, um, the Elantra, I mean, these, these cars are all very expressive, let's say, mm -hmm. in terms of their styling. Yours is expressive in a more conservative way. I mean, I, I think that I love that body side, the crisp, the way that uh, mm -hmm. it goes straight across. The but bone line. The bone line. And so who is the person who's going to buy this car and not that Mazda 3? Some people, I would say, are, design is one thing that can set one manufacturer uh, aside from another. But design is not necessarily something that sells the car, at least from the data that we see. So, but it, it can be a rejection reason for some people. And um, I'll bring up the Honda Civic as an example, which came out two years ago. Even to this day, it's a very, very polarizing design. I mean, you definitely know it's a Civic when you see it on the road. Um, but the previous Civic owners, when, when you listen to them, a lot of them rejected that new styling. It was just way too out there. It pushed the limit too much. Some people love it. It's very, very sporty. It's very aggressive. They like the look. Um, we chose something much more in between. And when you look at each one of the manufacturers, they have not stepped away from styling. They've embraced it. And when you look at the past, I would say, maybe 10 years, maybe, maybe even less than that, when you look at... Um, Two generations of Corolla, for example, like a 2012 Corolla, that thing is a shoebox with wheels. It's very boring looking. And now you look at today's Corolla, I mean, even the Corolla has gotten very expressive. And design is free when you do it from the get-go, when you're first doing the design of the car. And it's also a differentiator. It allows one manufacturer to step out away from, from the others. And so it's really like choosing a piece of clothing. I think we, we talked about this a little bit off, off stage before the show, but the, the car is an expression of yourself, and some people go for the really, really sporty stuff, and they, they want to be seen. Some people want something that's sporty, yet still classy and premium looking. And I think that's, that's the direction that we've gone, is uh, not a, uh, something that meets everybody's tastes and standards, but it's still a very sporty looking car, but it's also something that you can take to a, a fancy night, night out, for example, and still be recognized and still look good. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Randy M here is uh, written in to ask, uh, is the digital cluster available across all trim levels? It is not. It is only available on our SEL and SEL Premium trims, which are the two top trims. Um, it is also bundled with a number of other features that, that come into those as well. So um, the digital cockpit is bundled with the ambient lighting and also Beats Audio which is one of the techie things I forgot to mention before. but <laughs> Beats our, is a big name in yeah, audio. Yeah, you should have probably <laughs> led with that one. <laughs> it's, our, it's our new premium audio system. We're very excited for the, the new relationship with Beats. We worked with them hand in hand on the development of the audio system for this car. It sounds phenomenal. It, thwack, it makes everything go thwump in the car. Um, a really great sounding audio system. Um, additionally, I would be remiss with the techie gadgets. It's not all the... The bells and whistles uh, and the buttons that you can press, but also we've also listened to people in terms of the safety of the car. And Volkswagen's 
it's one of our core core brand messages around the world is safety first with this car. The Jetta has been optimized for safety in terms of its crash worthiness, a whole bunch of other factors, but also in terms of driver's assistance systems. So those have been creeping up even in our competitors. And the Jetta has also noticed that, and we've really taken that to heart. So even on the Jetta S, it's not standard, but you can get blind spots, a rear traffic alert, and also front assist, which is our emergency um, Break. Front, front emergency warning and braking system. That's available on the Full S. stop braking? Uh, we cannot guarantee the car will come to a full stop. I don't think anybody but can But it does, it, it, I mean, it doesn't only take you to down to 20 miles no. an hour and no. stop. It'll do its best within the distance that's available. Gotcha. Right. At least it will minimize the effect. But we've um, launched that with a very, very aggressive price point for the car. So on a, and what's on a, on a manual Jetta S with with the driver's assistance package, you're coming in at under 19,000 with yeah. the driver's assistance package. And so what's the driver assistance package standalone price? $450. Oh, that's that's so, pretty good. And nobody in the segment can actually offer it th those two features for that price. For that price. Yeah. Right. Now, all in the SE, which is our second trim, that is now standard on the car. When you get up to the SEL and the SEL Prima, again, our top, two top trims, we've thrown in not just those, but the full kit and caboodle all of the driver's assistance systems. So everything you would get on an Atlas and Tiguan, top of line, it is standard on an SEL and SEL premium. So for example, adding in the automatic high beam control, which we call light assist, our lane keeping system, and also adaptive cruise control. Those are all standard on the car, not optional. Mm -hmm. when, There's actually very few options you can get on the car. When, when you talk about emergency braking, that's something that some automakers, especially on their entry level cars, have left only on the high trim whereas other ones have gone all in and they're actually using it as leverage to say, the other guys don't offer it, we offer it standard. When you guys were planning this car, where did you see the customer's opinion on you know, how important something like emergency braking was for them? Very, very important, not only um, for, to protect against future regulations, which will be coming eventually, it's just uh, yet to, uh, the markings are on the wall, but when we also listen to people early on and what their attitudes were about safety, especially when we're stuck in so much traffic every day, you hear people say, if there's something out there that can save a life, it should be accessible in the car. If you can make it standard, make it standard, it, but it should be available to everything. And so from the very get-go, we planned uh, at least the basic systems, um, the ones that people care mostly about, like the, the forward collision warning, that was always planned from the very get-go, even on the entry car. Joe Laszlo wrote in to say, are these cars built in Mexico? And what are your concerns about today's trade climate? Ah, two very interesting questions. So uh, yes, the car is made in Puebla, Mexico. And uh, actually every Jetta since the second generation, the Mark II has been made in Puebla. So we are continuing that. Uh, they actually have excellent quality control in the plant right now. Um, have a very, very good relationship with the plant. And so we're happy to continue production with them. Um, about the trade environment, um, there's, who no, knows, there right? is, there's no good answer to that question other than who knows what President Trump will say tomorrow regarding tariffs and, and whatnot. So uh, I don't think there's much I can say on that other than we have to wait and see how, how the drama unfolds. That's right. That's a good way to put it, how the drama unfolds. Speaking in entirely theoretical terms, yeah. does the MQB architecture make it easier to move production globally than, than uh, it, you know, 10 years ago? Yes and no. So some of our plants already have MQB production in them, and so yet it's very adaptable to that because they're already tooled up for it. Um, but in some cases, in a plant where they have not made MQB before. So for example, um, the Pueblo factory is actually two factories side by side. On one side of the factory, they make all the Golfs and the Golf Sport Wagons and the Alltrack, which is an MQB line. On the other side, they make Beetles and Gaul, um, sorry, Beetles and Jettas, which are, are not MQB. And so they actually had to tool up that side of the factory for MQB, um, which took some time to do and some investment to do. But what, once the factory and, and is And that's ready not even for, to speak of different body snappings and all the other complexities correct. you get with yeah. different cars. Correct. But I mean, once, uh, theoretically, once the factory is tooled up for it, it should be reasonably easy to then transfer another MQB car into it. Here's a comment. It's not a question, but mm -hmm. you'll get a kick out of it. Rear wheel drive, please, one. 
says, Dad's first new car was an 85 Jetta diesel, base manual with no air. We crammed a family of six into it, four kids with a car seat in the back. I applaud them <laughs> and that they're all still, still alive after sweating in the back seat. Some dedication. <laughs> yes. But awesome. Yeah. Good, Al good to hear the story. It is. I like that. Alexander Karabitsis writes in to say, what made you decide against developing this model to suit the Chinese market? He says, I would have thought that a car like mm -hmm. the Jetta would sell well in China. Actually, it is being sold or it will be sold in China. So there's really two halves of Jetta. So um, the Jetta is developed for North America. There is a twin of the car, which is called the Sagittar. And that is the Chinese version of the car, which is slightly different. I mean, it shares the same underpinnings. It will be on MQB, but it will have slightly different styling, both exterior and interior, to suit the Chinese market. Because um, the Jetta in China, it's not a compact car. It's actually, uh, a lot of people get driven around in the car by, by a driver. It's uh, actually a quite substantial car in China. It's bigger than this car? No, no, no. Um, the Jetta is perceived as a large car oh, 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 okay. in Jetta, or the Sagittarius, I should say, is okay. a large car in China. Is the Chinese version, some other cars have a long wheelbase Chinese version. Is mm -hmm. that the case here? The, what, are there any dimensional changes for the it rear is, seat? Uh, from what I do remember from a few years ago, it is slightly longer than, than the car that we do see here in the U.S. So how is, how is the reaction of the new Mark 7 car been since it's been in the market in the United States? So far, the reaction has been very good. I mean, granted, it's been on sale for maybe six weeks now. It's mm -hmm. brand new. literally brand new. Um, but so far, we've gotten a hell of a lot of enthusiasm from dealers who are super excited about the car. Um, they're very happy to have it on their dealerships. Customers are excited about the car. Sales are off to a, a very nice start. Um, some key things that customers really are keying off of are the fuel economy, the digital cockpit, the ambient lighting, um, and even the Beats audio. I mean, they're all really, really things that are get, catching people's eyes. And pricing, didn't you lower the base price of this car too? Yes, so I mentioned all the lighting that was standard on the car, along with Apple CarPlay, the Android Auto, that's standard. Um, Bluetooth standard, cruise control is standard, but we also lowered the price by $300 compared to the outgoing car. So. You don't really hear about that very often happening in the industry, but we've put on over $1,000 worth of equipment onto the car and lowered the price, yes. And actually, every Jetta across the lineup, the price has been lowered, and we put more content into the car. Now, are you just eating margins, or is it the MQB no, platform it, that gives is, you that efficiency? It is primarily the MQB architecture, um, electrical as well as structural, that allows us those economies of scale, those huge economies of scale worldwide that allow us to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous value story, not just in terms of purchase price, but in terms of cost of ownership as well, like I mentioned the fuel economy. So um, there's a lot of reasons why people should be shopping a Jetta if they haven't considered it in, in the past. Just to put my little plug in there. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, I think uh, this car will really make people think twice about the car if, if they've ruled it out in the past. You were talking about a two-liter engine earlier, so I, I know I'm going to butcher this name, but it looks like Anaruda Ier, Liar, I'm not sure, uh, wants to know, does the two-liter I-4 need premium? No, it will require regular glass, oh, huh. which is actually the same as the outgoing GLI. Okay. We, we switched that to regular fuel as well. NC uh, wants to know, any thought about a 48-volt system? And I think that's a reference to a mild hybrid. Mm -hmm. But you, you were saying, now nah, you got the fuel economy. No, thing. there's no reason for a, a hybrid at this point. When you're getting 40-plus miles per gallon highway, uh, to put a hybrid system into the car, add weight to the car, which would affect the handling in a negative way, and add it, uh, several thousands of dollars to the price for... Um, maybe five to maximum 10 miles per gallon fuel economy difference. I, I think people have to think about what is the payback period for that, and it's really not going to make much sense if people do the math. Mm -hmm. It's much better off just uh, with a lot of the gains that we've been able to do with the normal combustion engine and, uh, and really see that come to fruition. Is it safe to say that part of the simplicity of the offer, you know, talking about not having a hybrid, um, partially due to those gains, but is it, is it safe to say that part of that's also due to Volkswagen's strategy of uh, announcing a whole slew of battery, battery electric vehicles and, you know, the, from a, a green play 
you'll have that covered very soon. Whereas, which plays back to how, what you were saying about the hybrid, where if it's if it's simply a, an economy like a price and fuel economy issue, mm -hmm. you have it covered on this car. And if you want, you know, if you want it for green reasons or or just to be really extreme about saving gas, mm -hmm. I, I would Volkswagen's say, working on that as well. I would say that's part of it. We do have uh, a lot of plans in the works for a full suite of battery electric vehicles. Those will be out in the next few years. Um, but we do get people asking about Jetta Hybrid still. We did have one on the market from um, 2013 to 2016. Um, but it was, it, to be honest, it was an expensive car because the hybrid system was very advanced and it cost a lot of money. Are people willing to, to pay that? Or in the end, do they just want a green car or do they really want good fuel economy? And uh, at least in the compact class, it's extremely price sensitive for one. People are shopping with their wallet, and, but they're not just thinking of the purchase. They're thinking of over time that they have that car, whether it's a three-year lease or if they're owning the car for 10 years, um, they, want it, they want that payback time to be within the time that they have the car. So people are thinking short-term, some of them, over a three-year lease. Do I get the payback in two years? Um, people that keep the car until it dies, uh, they, they don't want to wait until the 10th year for it to actually pay for itself. They'd like to see something sooner than that. Um, it's not saying we aren't investigating hybrid solutions as well. Um, but yes, we do have a full battery electric suite that, that is in the works. Look, we're going to have to wrap this segment up. We've gone longer than we thought we might because so many questions came in. And I apologize to some of the people who wrote in. We didn't get to every question. And some of those who did, uh, who, who, whose question we did get to, I, I had to edit it down for, for time and, and space. But Daniel Shapiro, thanks so much for coming on. Obviously, your Jetta has generated a lot of interest. I'm very happy. Thank you for having me. Everybody, go out and go to your local dealership and check out the car. Or hopefully you see one on the street. It's a fantastic car. It's night and day ahead of uh, the previous generation. And it's really the most technologically advanced Jetta that's ever been out there. Real good. We're going to take a very quick commercial break right now. We're going to come back. We've got more things to talk about of what's going on in the automotive industry. Um. And this is the part of the show where Dr. Data, I hope, yes. has a number. Okay, so this is sort of a different number. You guys will get it. So, um, Katie, Carmen, whomever. Okay, so. Survey says? So according to, these are all research organizations. So eMarketer, Second Measure, Tuluma, Earnest Research, okay? And they're saying, they're looking at the same thing, okay? But we have one says 24.4%, 31.9%, 35%, 43%. This is something that they say that Americans have done, and this is related to the automobile industry. This is oh, this, that they've done, right? Not so, what they think, or this is not what they think. What this is the, so. So, I, so somebody's gone and said, "Have you done this?" And so this is, and, and so the, these are recent numbers. Okay. Well, when you put it that way, the first thing I think of is you've asked them, "Have you had sex in a car?" This is a family-oriented show, John. Oh, I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, Dr. Tatey would not go down that road. I love that guess. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm guessing it has something to do with using a device in the car, so maybe, like, uh, sent an email while driving. Ooh, I like that. That's texting while driving? That's good, too. Yeah. I, 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 my guess would be this the texting is, numbers would be higher, actually. I but. think you're right. Or maybe to combine what I was saying before, maybe they were sexting and driving. <laughs> All right, this, this, is, this is going in the complete, this is, is completely off the rails. This is, this is much less lascivious than that. And the answer is percentage of Americans who have used Lyft or Uber in 2018, hmm. which I think that is a remarkable number. Well, it, it looks like someone, at least one of these companies needs to check their methodology. Well, that it much depends. Spread. Well, yeah, or is it, you know, region specific? So, for example, right. the earnest research, is that the Bay Area? Is eMarketer, is that out in Wyoming someplace? At but, the but I mean, just, but if, if, we, if we just sort of like look at all those numbers and just say, okay, it's, it's roughly 32%. So one out of three Americans have used it. Yeah. That's a very impressive number. It is. And when you consider even 25%, you know, a couple things. The reason Uber, one of the reasons Uber and Lyft exist 
at least in smaller metro areas, is because there isn't enough cab service or the cab service doesn't drive far and wide enough to cover the area. Um, you know, so it speaks to that, um, you know, how much there was a demand for some better form of transportation there. But also, 25%, uh, you know, that's not people giving up their car, but if you told the automakers 8% of people are going to start only using Uber or Lyft, they would panic. This is 25% of people have at least tried it once, or 43% of people have tried it once. Mm -hmm. That's why I say that that's <laughs> a big number and, you know, points to what I've been saying all along, that we are headed into a future where we're not going to have as many people owning cars. I don't think car ownership's ever going to go away, don't get me wrong, but I think a lot of people are going to give up cars in the future, owning cars in the future. Well, that's sort of a perfect segue to uh, your organization did a study of people, uh, car ownership and liking to drive um, that just came out. Are, are you familiar with that? I'm, yes. I, I mean, Haggerty, Haggerty's a big organization, so <laughs> yeah, I don't want to put I've you, I don't want to put you on the spot I've, about I've this. At it. Yeah. So, so, so this, this was basically, and I, I thought that this was, this was very surprising to me that it says 81% of millennial drivers um, taking part in the survey said they like, love, or are passionate about driving. Gen X, 78%, baby boomers, 79%. Now, I, I, I got to say, I'm skeptical. 81% of millennials love to uh, drive. Millennial survey. Well, but it was 1,000 people in okay. it, it, I mean. Okay, well, one thing, one thing that uh, challenges that conventional wisdom about millennials, you know, millennials don't drive, millennials aren't driving cars. What we found, I think it's in this survey, I could be mistaken. Um, I haven't read it in a couple weeks. But uh, what we found is that it wasn't that millennials weren't buying cars, it's that they put it off because of the financial crisis or any other thing that uh, you'll see on social media that when someone is telling millennials they're doing things wrong, you know, they, they cite that they, you know, wages are stagnant or rent is too high and they can't buy anything except for avocado toast. Uh, they weren't buying cars during the financial crisis or because they had to wait until later in life when they were in a different financial stake. And so at the, now, at the, you know, 25 to, 38 or whatever that chunk is, they're buying cars at a higher rate than Gen X was before them, when Gen X was in that age group. So I believe it, one, because it's a message we're promoting officially, <laughs> <laughs> also because I, optimistically I want, to, I want driving to exist forever, but also because I think it is this thing where maybe they're just waking up a little later to, to cars and being able to go over anywhere they want. But like, love, or are passionate about driving? And I'm not referring to his earlier uh, guess of the number <laughs> on the uh, passionate part. Well, like, you know, that's like a, you know, that's like a six or a seven. On Did a you like seven. driving over here today? Uh, yeah, it was all right. Yeah, but you, yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes driving in heavy traffic. Right. Yeah. So that, that's the exception. See, and I think that, that that gets to the whole thing of, you know, the question of, of car ownership in large cities. So I was just spent the weekend in Chicago and uh, you know, availed myself of of Lyft, you know, rather than having a car there, and uh, and and you could just see that a lot of people were doing that. I mean, you just saw so many cars that um, that that had the the Uber or Lyft or both decals in their windows, and I just think that you know, you have a certain percentage of people who are just saying, you know, it's it's uh, you know, this hotel we were staying in, it was like seventy bucks a night to park there. Thirty dollars to park. That's car. crazy, right? I mean, it is, and but I mean, but you just look around. I mean, that's the sort of average thing that's going on. And so, I imagine that if you had an apartment or a condominium in a place like downtown Chicago, parking would be very expensive. So, I, I just wonder about ownership. It, it, you know, if you want to get into semantics, you know, like love driving, it, it could be you know, people like to mountain. People like love or are passionate about mountain biking. It doesn't mean they do it every day, right? Which feeds a little bit into our message of of driving always being there as an option for people. You know, we're, we're, we definitely, Haggerty as a company, is definitely pro-autonomy and pro-safety, but we also want to say, you know, there's going to be a lane or there's going to be, if you want to take the wheel, you're going to be able to take the wheel, but part of that, it comes from the fact that, like this survey says, we think that people want to do that. Mm -hmm. We're not just saying, uh, you know, hey, we need to keep to the old ways. We're saying, this is a, a pleasurable experience. You can unplug and you can go do things. But to your point, only when there's not traffic or, you know. Right, yeah. What, when you got a great twisty two-lane road and no traffic, go for it. Yeah, or, or, you know, to be 
perfectly cruel when you're not stuck in San Francisco on Market Street because the whole road is clogged with Uber and Lyft drivers waiting to pick up fares. <laughs> good point. Hey, we got a, a question here from Barry Rector that I think is good. Uh, Barry Rector from Indy says, which, and Gary, I'll throw it to you. What's your take on Tesla's assembly line under tents? What's the untold story? All right, so, so first of all, you know, when I heard this tent thing, I, I'm thinking canvas, right? Or some cloth like something material. flimsy. Yeah, I mean the thing it, it looks like it looks like it looks like a concrete tube for God's sakes. I mean it's it's not like they're making this thing, you know, in the back 40 somewhere. Um, does it look absolutely sketchy? Yes. I mean, it, it you know, it, it seems open on both ends. I mean, th there's got to be some issues there. Um, would I want my car to have been built in a factory like that? Mm. Probably not. Um, yeah, I mean, so here's a picture of it. And it, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's substantial. Yeah. But, you know, when I first saw that thing, I thought, oh, rework line. I didn't think this is an assembly line. To me, it's that, that, that's the kind of thing that you build in a big rush because your quality at right. the end of the line, you, you got so many cars in repair, that's what you build that for. So, so does anybody know for sure that no. it is Nobody an assembly knows. line? Well, Elon has said it is. And he said that they threw it together with scrap pieces they had laying around in the warehouse, which I don't buy for a second. No. Unless it's a rework line, and all you need is a conveyor and guys putting things on the car that you need a conveyor. You just line. need carts to push the or, thing. Or that too. Or that too. I mean, it'd be very simple to, to be able to do that. What do you think, Mike? I, you know, it, it ties back into. I just watched the the episode you had with the uh, with the teardown. It ties back into that. There's a lot of brilliant things about Tesla, and making cars is not one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> to me, it's on the one hand, they're doing something about it. I really like that. You know, they are in some ways addressing a problem that they have about getting the the production volume up. On the other hand, you're at Numi, which peaked at something like 800,000 vehicles, and you have to build a tent. To right. increase your your volume, That's exactly right. Why didn't Toyota have that problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's it, so for those who don't know, so so the the Tesla plant used to be a plant that was a joint venture plant between General Motors and um, Toyota that was New United Motor Manufacturing Incorporated, New Me, and it's it's a huge assembly plant. I mean, it's it's just massive. Oh, I was in there when and, it was New Me, and it massive. Is right. So so it would it, it, it would have the square foot capacity in order to build 5,000 a week without much of a problem at all. I mean, that's, so to well, your yeah. point, why do you need this thing on the parking lot? Yeah. Well, I saw Ford, Mark Truby at Ford tweeted out something today saying, hey, at uh, the Dearborn truck plant, you know, we're making a truck every 53 seconds. So that's over a thousand a day. That's over five thousand a week on five days, not on seven right. days. And uh, you know, that's one of Ford's assembly plants already doing what the machine that's you know, what did Elon call it? The machine that makes the machine right. or whatever, and how he was gonna be so much better at it. So anyway, we'll we'll know very shortly if he has hit his five thousand model threes a week target. Mm-hmm which he said he'd be doing this week. Good luck to him. Yeah. Um, you know, so we were talking about autonomous vehicles. Um, so May Mobility, a um, autonomous technology startup company uh, announced this week that they're gonna be running shuttles, autonomous shuttles in downtown Detroit. Like next month, is it? Um, Coming fast, right. And, and this is for people who work for uh, one of the Quicken Loans companies to go from, from their parking lot to their workplace in the Campus Marshes area. Um, that will be the first time anything like this is happening on public streets anywhere. No, 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 no. Because remember, Waymo's already doing uh, autonomous Pacificas. With, with, but I mean, with a safety driver in the thing. It sounds to me like this. Uh, well, is the new autonomy. There's a section of I think it's Singapore, but somewhere in Southeast yeah, Asia. Yeah, Singapore. And I think new autonomy's done a test there. But they, they, but that's a special that. area of town designated for autonomous testing too. Right. Well, yeah, they're doing routes between, as I understand it, trains and subways in in Singapore, and they've been doing that for a couple of years. Aptive, formerly Delphi, is heavily mm -hmm. involved in that. The thing that I find so interesting about this main mobility is Magna is going to be building the vehicles. Mm. And uh, we recently saw Bosch buy another startup in the Detroit area called Split. 
And so we're seeing suppliers get involved in these mobility services. And we're going to be seeing tier one suppliers essentially competing against major right. OEMs. Well, in China, I mean, uh, Magna announced that they're working with uh, BAIC, the uh, Beijing Automotive, whatever the industry other, corporation, okay, yeah. in, in building cars. And uh, so they're working from design, engineering to manufacturing. Right. So, you know, and, and they, they, of course, you know, Magnus Steyer builds all manner of cars, which I'm sure you know better than I do. I was trying to think of the last one. It might have been the VW EOS, but they d they do everything to final assembly on right. in some cases. Isn't the Jaguar I-Pace going to be made by Magna Steyer? Yeah, I think you might be right. I think I'm right on that. So, so, but the point is, is that here's a, here's a supplier that just isn't providing parts. It isn't providing you know. Oh, here's a fender. Put that on your car. I mean, yeah. they're just doing the whole thing. Exactly right. Uh, uh, Navia is another one that is already doing in Vegas right now, and they've been doing it for a while, uh, autonomous shuttles running around Vegas that the public can mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. So it's already started. Yeah, uh, in Detroit it is interesting, one, because there are parts of Detroit, this is probably an outdated uh, idea, but there are parts of Detroit where driving seems a bit like the Wild West because you have large roads that are, you know, if, if the further up you get into the middle of Detroit, and these won't be running there, you just have, you know, larger roads, um, and it just seems, you know, like another car, you never, if you, if someone else on the road just happens to be crazy, you're like, well, what could they do? There's a lot of road here. <laughs> Downtown is not like that, but you still have, uh, you know, a decent amount of potholes and rough roads and things that, that uh, challenge, you know, even just the longevity of a, of a car that's meant, especially compared to Las Vegas, where you're mm -hmm. essentially, you know, driving on a, the smoothness of a golf cart path the whole time. Right. Um, so the other drivers, I think, will be fine, but, you know, the little challenges of, you know, even traffic cones routing something around construction. Um, mm -hmm. for, for some reason in my head, I feel like that's more common in Detroit than other places. Well, we're seeing something very interesting happening here with, with these efforts, is if you want to do what cruise automation part of General Motors is doing, or Waymo, or Ford, or Toyota, of doing level four, level five, very complicated. Man, it, it, all kinds of sensors, all kinds of sensor fusion, all kinds of safety issues involved. But if you want to do these low speed, maximum 25 mile an hour, dedicated route shuttles, it allows you to stick your toe in the water as a mobility service provider for a fraction of the cost and much faster, like you say. You know, these guys, uh, uh, May Mobility, are going to launch next month. Yeah. And so it's, it's very interesting how it's opening the door for startups and suppliers, tier ones, to get involved in these mobility services, concentrating on these much lower cost vehicles. And uh, I think that, that approach is going to pay off for them in the long run because they're getting into the market doing this ahead of the big guys. Right. And, and, and then if we go back to those numbers of people using Lyft and Uber, suddenly this whole last mile phenomenon begins to probably cause some, some issues of uh, acid indigestion among OEMs uh, uh, in the executive suite. Well, a, a tiny shuttles like this too are, are, when you look at the problems of infrastructure, right? Like autonomy is being sold on a lot of things. One of them is safety. One of them is the convenience of not driving. But when you look at something like a shuttle running from a parking lot to a business, that's, uh, this is a really great solution to that, you know, versus building another parking structure or having people driving around for parking or building the infrastructure required to put light rail in there. So this is something I, I, see, I could see um, taken off very quickly. And, and even from a perspective of other drivers, it's not, you know, you see the shuttle, it looks like something where you go, okay, I know what this is going to do. It's running a route. It's very predictable. It, it doesn't pose any of the issues of interaction. It doesn't pose many issues with interaction with the rest of the world as other autonomy mm -hmm. solutions would. Yeah. Joe Laszlo writes in, uh, listening to us talk, he, he wonders who's going to be the first to geofence Disney World for autonomous shuttles. <laughs> and, and you're onto it, Joe. That's exactly where these, these things are going right. to spread. High density, very uh, high demand, uh, but as I just said before, relatively low cost way of getting into it. And I'm sure when it's done, it'll be the Disney Imagineers and it'll be the coolest <laughs> damn shuttle you can imagine in your life. So I want to switch gears entirely here. And, and this, is, this is something that I, I found to be very curious that, so Ram Truck announced this week that it will continue 
the last generation Ram 1500, and they're going to call it the 1500 Classic. Now, they're going to sell it simultaneously with the new Ram, which we did on the show here. And, and uh, so why would a company do this? Oh, I mean, it's the best of both worlds, right? You keep the old one, and now you can cut the price. Tooling's all paid for. You know they're only going to do this for a year or two. And now you've got the best of both worlds. So you can sell low, low price for those who want it, or this beautiful brand new truck with all the cool stuff that you charge a lot more for. Okay, but is, is, isn't it going to eat the seed corn, basically? Uh, maybe, but, you know, you can supply something to your fleet customers who maybe don't care what kind of gains you're getting on the new car without undermining the resale value of the new truck. You don't have the risk of losing sales during ramp up because you have this supply of old trucks. And frankly, you know, it might be fearic, but you are uh, undercutting the compact trucks from the competition. Oh, I hadn't great about that. point. <laughs> yeah. What? Very... I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. That makes sense. Because uh, now the Ram Classic sounds like Coke Classic. It sounds like a marketing faux pas, but uh, Chevy and Ford aren't quite doing that. So. Well, you think about it. I mean, you're going to, you know, Chevy has a Colorado and Ford's going to have the Ranger, mm -hmm. and Ram is going to have an inexpensive full-size truck. I mean, yeah. you go back into the circular logic that brought, that got rid of compact trucks in the first place, which is, why would I get the little truck when I can get the full-size truck for $1,000 more? But uh, I think the trucks have gotten so big that the compact, or midsize, has you know, a little bit of its own unique selling proposition. Randy M says, Nissan did this with the Rogue Select. I'm not familiar with that. Is it, what, did they keep an old Versa? Oh, 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 no, isn't, isn't it the Versa and the Versa Note? Wasn't that the... Uh, well, Volkswagen's doing it with the Tiguan. Um, Chevy did it with the Impala uh, but did, a couple but, but of Impalas ago. Thing, it wasn't, I mean, and Malibu. they had the Malibu Classic. It was yeah. the same name, and, but wasn't that all fleet? Yes. So, so the thing I wonder about is, is that, again, going back to the Lyft and Uber thing, which is beginning to be like a broken record, for those of you who know what a record is, um, <laughs> that, that basically I'm sure that there's a lot of fleet business that's just drying up. You know, and there, that's an, drying up, you think, fleet business? From the, the point of view that if, if you look at what's going on with the taxi market, which is going down, mm -hmm. I've got to believe that a lot of people are no longer getting Hertz and, and Avis and, and Alamo and so on. Bec when they go to a place to vacation, they're just using... Uh... Well, they're not renting tr pickups, though. No, no, no. What they're doing is, is that so fewer people are renting cars, therefore there are fewer fleets buying cars. Um, I think that's true. I think that you're, you're right on that. But, you know, when it comes to trucks, it tends to be contractors who are buying pickups, not daily rental companies who are doing it. Joey's cleaning lady writes in to say fleets will buy the classic Ram, your point, Mike. And I think you're onto something there because I hadn't thought about that either. Now you can take those classic Rams, dump them into fleets without hurting the residual of your, of your high new one. profit new truck. So, but I, I, I like your ideas. Fleet and compete against the mid-sized trucks from the others. There's a reason we have you on the show, <laughs> Mr. Austin. I have a couple good ideas every <laughs> once in a while. Okay, one more topic. And then All right, so this, okay, up. now this, this, is, this has got to be the most absurd name of a race that has ever existed, and tell me if I'm wrong. So this will be forthcoming at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and apparently they're going to make a midget track, and they're going to run the midgets during the, this race. Well, they have the short track in the nearby park. Is this different? No, no, is this the, is in the infield. This will okay, be in the infield. turn three. All right, so this is the Big Machine Vodka 400 at the Brickyard powered by Florida Georgia Line. <laughs> <laughs> TM. I mean, that's the name of the race. It's, that's pretty stupid. And this is, this is the band Florida Georgia Line, just to be clear, not the actual state line or some kind of tourism yeah. board. That's Church not me. That's, that's not clear. <laughs> but, uh, wow, I mean... Uh, well, here's, here's the sad part of the story. You know, the Brickyard used to, that's the NASCAR race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It used to get a bigger crowd than the Indy 500. Now you can shoot cannons through the stands and not hit anybody. So they've decided to bring a dirt track race 
as part of the weekend entertainment for the NASCAR race, just hoping people will show up to watch the dirt car race and stay for the NASCAR one. That's how far down the Brickyard 400 has dropped. You know, uh, we just had the Detroit Grand Prix here recently, which uh, I thought was, I, I watched it on TV. I thought it was a good race. I really like Indy right now. But anyone who goes to the festivities, the only thing they talk about is the super trucks race. And yeah, yeah, that, that is the best and part. It, it speaks to, this is something too, where people are gonna go, oh so man. To explain, the super trucks is they put ramps out on the Yeah, they the put stadium track. trucks, like big, huge off-road, like Baja style trucks. Right. Racing they, a road they, course. They hit these ramps and they're 12 feet in the air. Yeah, and then they have to brake for a corner. Uh, <laughs> It makes for great races. Sometimes they tip over. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, a, little bit, it's a little yeah. bit like hockey. Everybody's waiting for a fight. Um, everybody's kind of waiting for a car to roll over. But it's also, it's also good racing. And I think that's maybe what speaks to the decline is, um, you know, it's, it, the, the racing has somehow lost its appeal or, or got too big and is contracting to a more healthy size. But, uh, you know, dirt tracks, that's exciting stuff. So, 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 so in other words, so, so the regular race. It's an racing, acknowledgement that the regular race is boring. It's, or the regular racing has become too predictable and too homogenous, and they're just basically going around in a circle or driving around the track at Sonoma. Or yeah, and, I think these trucks are like, holy moly, what are they going to do now? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to. The racing isn't terrible, but I think homogenous is probably the best word for it. Yeah, well, remember that the trucks are out for what, 10, 15 laps max. So yeah. it's like having, you know, sorbet in between courses. <laughs> you know, it's just a little taste of something and it's gone. Whereas the NASCAR races grind on for hour after hour after hour. And in today's easily distracted, all kinds of media inputs coming in from all over the place world, you know, plunking down in front of the television or at a race for hours on end, it, it's just not working for NASCAR anymore. Mm -hmm. It's also, it's a way to get someone in the door. I mean, you, you talk about a sorbet in between meals. It's also an appetizer. You get, seeing motorsports live is a unique experience. And, uh, you know, it's still a, a feature NASCAR race is a lot of money. And maybe people are reluctant to give that a try. Get them into the midget race and they're like, oh man, this is sweet. I want to see the big cars now. Yeah, yeah that's a good yeah. point. Well, look, uh, we should probably wrap okay. this up now, but Mike Austin, thanks so much for showing up. Thanks again. It's great. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely have you back, even if you show up late again the next time. That's okay. <laughs> I'll use my one pass. Hopefully I have <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, uh, we're going to be off next week, mm -hmm. but we'll be back uh, the week after that. And we're off next week because the whole crew is shutting down <laughs> all next week, me included. So I'm looking forward to that. But anyway, great doing this show. And as always, want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. People are buying more of them. Where do you think this thing's getting old? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't. And just put in bigger engines and hood scoops. And you know, we thought they were going to put it on a new platform. Well, they shit canned those plans. Now they're just going to modify the existing platform and take it on however long they can milk it for. Why not? I yeah. mean, I understand, but uh, we're I, we're beyond the point of you know. 25% structural stiffness gains that you used to see. You know, the reason why they came out with an all new platform before was because they could make such gains. Maybe it's right. harder to do that now. Well, or especially versus cost. Or maybe they just paid for all that stuff and they just like. <laughs> I talked to a couple of recently retired FCA guys and they said the Julio platform that it was supposed to go on was not wide enough or would not accommodate a car as wide as the Challenger or Charger. Yeah, those cars are not doing badly at all.
So Challenger was up actually 4% year over year through May. That's pretty good. And, you know, it's things like Hellcat and Demon that have, you know, renewed the interest in those cars. I remember talking to Tim Kaniskas. In fact, this is why I think he was promoted to Alpha and Maserati <laughs> is because he did such a good job uh, at Dodge. But, you know, he said his business plan for the Demon was 2,500 cars. And I talked, this was a year ago, he was saying, he says, you know, we've sold over 25,000 of them. So, you know, that's how you get people interested in what otherwise would be a dated vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and if you want, it's the only game in town, right? They, you want rear drive car that holds a child seat and, uh, or if you want a performance car that holds a child seat. You, you maybe, you, you've heard about the Demon, but you go into the dealership and they have a scat pack for like 40 grand. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's pretty Very nice. doable. Yeah. <laughs> well, good.